Hey everyone, Tony Sonic here. Before we get into the video, I want to establish some guidelines that I've set for this new series, in case any of you are curious just how it's going to operate. Number one, the disclaimer. People love and hate games for different reasons, so saying that certain aspects of a game are objectively good or objectively bad just what doesn't sit right with me. Maybe there might be a consensus here and there, but for the most part, likes and dislikes are ultimately subjective. Which is why I've set this series from my perspective, what I view to be good and bad about a certain game. Number two, I'm not going to be overly nitpicky like the CinemaSense channels. I'm not going to be turned off by a simple typo or whatever. But I am going to be viewing every game I cover in this series from the perspective of a completionist. The main stories, side objectives, collectibles, and even achievements, should a game have, have any. And all of it will be in consideration for my... For this series, which also means I have to complete every single game I cover in this series. Which eh, doesn't bother me. I fancy myself kind of a completionist anyways. With that said, I hope that I've said things clear and I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> Not even five minutes in and I'm already laughing at this game's humor. Alright, here we have our first sin of the game. This counter. It serves two purposes. The first is your general collectible counter in-game. Standard stuff in every 3D platformer under the sun. The other purpose is seen here as the fuel for Hat Kid's spaceship. My issue is, the counter says there are 40 timepieces in the vault, but when the vault opens up, we can clearly see that there are way more than 40 timepieces in there. What is this? Flying boat? All boats need to pay toll in Mafia Town. Even in s Mafia come in to collect. Funny gag, but how exactly did this Mafia guy get up here? Aside from boats, they don't really have any other means of transport, and I know a later act shows a Mafia riding a rocket. However, the same Mafia acts like this is a new thing, and despite their limited brain power, none of the others do the same thing. I love that Hack Kid's reaction to being sucked out of her ship and losing all her fuel is just annoyed. I love it. Dang, the art in this game is really good. Every one of these opening cards is really well drawn. Now is as good a time as any to say it. This game is such a good presentation. The art style captures that Dreamcast feel that you don't typically see in a lot of indie games. And I love it. it makes for such a memorable experience. The game also controls buttery smooth. There's such a nice flow and you always feel in control of your jumps. No jank whatsoever. Hey, I think one of your junk pieces fell and smashed right into the market's fountain. Messed it up real good. Uh, when no. The level intro showed that the fountain was broken before the timepiece smashed the fountain. In COD we trust. This game is hilarious, I tell ya. <laughs> 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 Why does that sound so adorable and yet so inspiring? How can she get a job as a leader? <laughs> hey, the Mafia has some strategy involved. You attack them one way too much, they'll block that attack. It's simple, but a nice way to make them more varied. Also, we'll be hearing quite a few good songs in this game, but even this simple one can't go unheard. Strangling is too kind. 
We smash them together into mush and put their remains in a jar. Then we sell the jar for pocket money. That'll be the ultimate salt in the wound. Okay, I don't know what's funnier. The fact that Mustache Girl's plan is so needlessly violent or the fact that Hat Kid is just going along with it, no questions asked. And in case anyone's wondering, how the heck did they manage to sneak this into an E10 kids game? It's simple, really. They didn't. Hat Kid has a raincoat and she looks adorable in it. Yes, that's a win. My video. What the? Huh? It's... It's slimy space alien! Mafia's a spaceship! Mafia knew all along! Mafia is being invaded by aliens! Ah! Everything about this sequence is worth five wins. Imagine the Mafia being so dumb that simply falling into mud is enough to trick them into thinking you're an alien from outer space. I mean, you are, but this is in a creepy sense. <laughs> Despite being the Mafia, they somehow have the manners to say please when telling you to go away. You just can't take these guys seriously, and I like that about them. So, it is you! Ever since you landed in Mafia Town, it's been raining with these magical hourglasses. You must be very lost, kid with the hat. You're in the heart of our town, standing before the most powerful man you will ever witness. Everything you've ever owned belongs to me now. So something interesting about this scene is when the game originally released on the PC, this scene had entirely different dialogue. It went along these lines. I'm guessing what they were going for was to add to the lore of the world before patching it out, but my question is, why would you change it? The dialogue isn't harmful in any way, and the new dialogue doesn't change much outside of the Mafia boss not knowing what the timepieces are. You could have left it alone and barely anything would change. But enough about that, we got awesome first boss music to jam to! So what do these things do anyway? Are they some sort of rare collector's item for nerds? Are they some sort of rare co Wait, huh? Whoa, what? What? about this this is crazy do you even realize what could be done with these we can make it so that you never got punched in the face by the mafia that one time we could beat up the mafia travel back in time and then beat them up again no wait we can make it so the Mafia never arrived on the island! Wait, wait, wait! Even better! We could be crime-fighting time travelers! Wait, what? This doesn't make any sense! You have all this power, and you're not gonna use it to fight evil? If you're not going to use them to fight evil, then I will. I'm not going to let this island remain as Mafia Town. I'll collect all the timepieces for myself. You have my word on it. Man, I want to win this scene for how well it sets up Mustache Girl, but that's ultimately its biggest failing. It builds up Mustache Girl as a huge threat, but she's barely in the game after this. Like, she floods Mafia Town with lava, yes, that's a thing she does, and if I remember correctly, there's a graffiti image of her somewhere at Dead Bird Studio, but aside from that, Mustache Girl has very little presence outside of the final boss, which is honestly a waste of both this scene and Mustache Girl as a character. 
One thing I skipped over, mostly because I didn't really know what to say about it, was the hat crafting system. And later in the game, you're expected to come back to this race with a special time stop hat. How would you know any of that? Well, the game actually lets you know ahead of time if you don't have an item you need for the level. That's a nice forethought there that more platformers should implement. So the mission here is to turn off all the faucets controlling the town volcano, and I'm not going to question why the Mafia have the faucets at all, because it's been made painfully obvious that they're incredibly stupid. What I am going to question is how turning off all the faucets reverts the lava back into water. Like, yeah, water starts flowing again once I'm done, but I don't think water flowing turns lava back into water. It'll cool it, but the most you'll get is an ocean of cooled lava. How did Cooking Cat get up into space? What, does she have some sort of rocket ship she's hiding? Cause other than that, I don't see how she could have gotten up here. The time risks scattered throughout each world are really cool. They're small, bite-sized challenges that can earn you extra time pieces if you're hurting for some. Yeah, yeah, there's obvious comparisons to Super Mario Sunshine's same levels, but that's clearly just its inspiration. If anything, they're better because the time risks are completely fair, while Sunshine's levels are needlessly frustrating. Double movie sunglasses, hell yeah! This movie studio is too big for the both of us, DJ. Grooves. The movie should be made by real birds. You moon penguins are just gonna write some loud, noisy treble. If I wanted a bunch of picnics to dance around while on birdseed, ha! I'd visit my grandchildren. <laughs> nonsense, darling, nonsense. You Owl Express birds are just gonna record another boring train-related western. You've done so for the last ten years, darling. What? No, we haven't, you buffoon! The rivalry between DJ Grooves and the conductor is very well introduced, and is one of the funniest parts of this whole game. I love that I'm being billed for the pettiest of things. This whole sequence just puts a smile on my face. Oh no, it's just a little girl. Hello. Oh wait, you're not a penguin. Well, that's good. I could use some non-penguin company around here, as all my penguins are frankly terrible actors. Here's the biz. I need your help. I'm on a terrible losing streak, and I just have to win this next annual bird movie award. There's no doubt, I absolutely must have you as the star! Here, let me take care of this. Wait, I was actually being billed during all that? I thought that was just a funny visual gag. How were we being billed during that? We were sneaking around. Even with this game's zaniness, this doesn't make any sense at all. Let's see how the picture turned out. <laughs> Darling, you move! The picture is ruined! How could you? We've got to fix this ugly mugshot up with some old-fashioned photo doctoring. Here, take these markers and turn yourself into the most stylish, fashionable young lady. Fun fact about this picture, whatever you draw here will actually show up on your save file. Yeah, whatever you draw becomes your save file icon. That's worth a win in my book. This entire act is one giant murder on the Orient Express spoof, and it's great. The crows asking you questions that come back later in some form, the lighting and general mood, the detective outfit you get, the distorted voice during the whole level, everything here is pure gold. Ooh, you're giving me the quiet treatment, eh? That's what a murderer would do. The conductor didn't really need to roll his R's that much, but he does anyway, and I love it. How'd you figure out it was me, hmm? I tried really hard to avoid being the villain in my own movie! The Express Owl isn't even dead! I just gave him the rubber knife and asked him to play dead for a few hours. Yeah, can I go now? I'm kinda sore from playing dead for so long. This rubber knife is also a bit uncomfortable. Funny twist, but that doesn't look like a rubber knife that just stuck on you. That looks like it's going through you. Rubber or not, you should probably be in a lot more pain than you are. Welcome to the first day of shooting, darling. We need to transform you into the biggest movie star the bird world has ever seen. You need to become a diva. That's why I've called for a press conference here on our moon set. 
You need to get out there in front of the cameras and electrify the public, darling. Get them really up and going for your movies. But how does this make a movie? I would understand if it was just propaganda for an upcoming movie, and that's certainly what it's portrayed as. However, the typical credits roll by the end of it, implying that everything we did was a movie. And I don't understand any of it. So the intro to Train Rush implies that the timepiece is on the funnel of the engine, but when the act ends, the conductor just gives it to us inside the engine. In this act, DJ Cruz is filming a parade, but why exactly are the parade members owls? It's made pretty clear from the start of the chapter that Gruz has penguins and the conductor has owls and that neither would use the other. Gruz even says in act one, So why is Gruz using owls now instead of his loyal penguins? So apparently quite a few people don't like the big parade, and to be entirely honest, I don't get why. You have plenty of space to work with, and there's only seven parade members chasing you. I get the feeling that they tend to confuse the normal act with the Death Wish version, which don't worry, we'll get to. Not really a win or a sin, just something I wanted to say. What is a win is Hack Kids Parade outfit. That's adorable. Oh, and the music for when you need to turn on the pyrotechnics and fireworks is a win as well. It's a really good track. Cool detail about this conversation, depending on who won the award, the last line changes to fit the opposing director. Nice attention to detail that deserves a win. The atmosphere for this level is spot on. The dark lighting and mood along with either the conductor or Gru's muffled lines about what they're going to do with the timepiece really captures a much darker side to this movie studio and can possibly be considered a prelude to a later level. Yeah, those of you who played this game know what I'm talking about, but we're not there yet. Although, I will say it is a little annoying having to traverse the level on repeat playthroughs when you just want to experience the boss fight at the end. It's pretty confusing to navigate in the latter half. The fight against the conductor, I'm referring to the conductor because he's the one I've always fought, is extremely good. He utilizes everything for the previous movies. The knife from the murder mystery, both. This one ain't rubber. the saws from Train Rush, the cars from Picture Perfect, the bomb from Train Rush, and even the parade for the big parade, as well as his own strength and other assortments. This is the best way to wrap up a chapter like this. And that's all without mentioning the boss theme, which is equally great in every way. Ladies and gentlemen, the best character in the entire game.
Okay, now that that's over, question. How am I still able to walk around without my soul? The soul controls everything in the body, yes? So how am I still able to do Snatcher's bidding if I don't have my soul? The Subcon Forest is the best chapter of the game, hands down. It's huge and expansive with tons to do and collect. Every character is something fun to offer. It's basically perfection. We want to die. We want to burn bright, and then burn out, become a cloud of smoke. I don't know whether I'm supposed to laugh or be totally creeped out by the fire spirits, and I think that was the intention, so... Win for the devs succeeding at their goal? Oh my! Uh, Mustache Girl actually followed up with her plan of stuffing the Mafia boss's remains in the jar. Um, incredibly morbid, but win for following through on a seemingly hollow grism for the sake of it threat? I don't know, man. I just wanted to feature this. Dang, the lead up to the weirdest boss in the game is surprisingly haunting. I mean, it fits given the place we're in, but man, win for pulling off suspense. Is that a flying toilet? Okay, in all seriousness, the Toilet of Doom is one of the most batshit insane yet unironically great bosses I've ever faced in a video game. This is on par with the Great Mighty Pooh for Conker's Bad Fur Day. Mechanically, it's nothing special. Throw the apple bombs at it and hit it whenever you can. But what makes this fight is the music. It's a mixture of three different themes from across the game. We got an original theme that's dramatic and menacing, The Snatcher's theme to emphasize who is in control of your soul and this entire domain. to assure that even though your soul is stolen and it's currently possessing an outhouse, it is still you in there. Why did they go so hard for the f***ing toilet? This is more of a final boss theme than the actual final boss theme. The lead up to Vanessa's manor is scary good. The mood shit that you blast through the ice and see the huge manor in the distance makes my skin crawl. Hey, Toby, boss told me to remind you that you signed that paper about not using your hats while in the manor. Yeah, don't use them. Thanks. Even though this instills an even greater feeling of dread, it's also a little contrived as the contract didn't say anything about not using your hats in the manor. And I checked after he said it too, nothing appears there either, which I gotta say, missed opportunity. Okay, now's as good a time as any to say that this entire level is straight out of a horror game. Everything about it from the atmosphere to Vanessa herself is terrifying on your first go around. Gears for Breakfast should make a horror game. They'd be good at it. However, I do have one major criticism. Vanessa only wanders the hallways, and she only enters the rooms when you make a loud enough noise, which really lowers the tension once you find that out. It's still a great level, but Vanessa could have been better. wasn't a coincidence. It popped off the moment he stopped being useful to me. And guess who else just became obsolete? That's right. You. Now that that possessed outhouse isn't bothering me anymore, and all those contracts of yours are tidied away, I don't need you around. Yeah, Snatcher turning on us at the end was pretty obvious, but with a character like Snatcher, it's not what he does. It's how he does it. And he does this very well. And he follows it up with the best boss in the whole game. 
First off, he takes away your hat, meaning you can't use your hat abilities or your badges. Second, in a clever fourth wall break, he refuses to turn blue, forcing you to throw one of his own attacks back at him to make him blue. Third, he's just a great boss all around. And of course, he's got a banger boss scene to go along with it. Your contract has expired is simply fantastic, especially when it ramps up in the second phase. <laughs> that kid just straight up Uno reverse snatchers attempt to get here to leave. I love this game. Ugh, Alpine Skyline. This is the worst area in the entire game, and that's including the DLC. It's long and big and boring and has the least interesting characters in the entire game. It doesn't even have a boss fight at the end, though that's understandable since there's no real villain here. Still, I greatly dislike this chapter and dread it every time I replay this game. But if there's one kudos I will give it, the Twilight Bell is a cool set piece. That's the one win this area deserves. So before we get into the finale, I want to cover the DLC that came out a couple years after this game. And there's something weird that happened to it. See, when this game first released, it was designed to be on the PC, PS4, and Xbox One, with a Switch port coming two years later. The DLC, however, first came to the PC and the Switch, and it took two more years for it to come to PlayStation and Xbox. What took so long? Why did the DLC come to the Switch first, the one console your game wasn't designed for, and not the consoles you had it planned from the beginning? Don't get me wrong, I like that it's here at all, but it confuses me why it ended up taking so long. Hi, how can I help you? He's so fluffy, I'm gonna die! So for this act, we need to do a bunch of tasks around the ship in order to win a timepiece from the Lost and Found, and I don't get why. Isn't the whole point of a Lost and Found to keep items that the guests lose so that you can return them if they come back for them? And yeah, I know the captain says that no one ever comes back for their stuff, but that only makes me question the existence of the Lost and Found even more. Not to mention, ship shape in general is pretty damn tough on your first attempt. Nowadays, for me at least, it ain't too hard, but on your first few attempts, it can be a hassle. Plus, there's an achievement you could get that involves doing all 18 tasks without upsetting the captain, meaning the meteor icon can't change from calm to annoyance even once, which makes an already difficult act even harder. In place of a traditional boss, which makes sense since this chapter didn't have a villain either, we get Rock the Boat, which, in the context of the chapter, is a pretty good final level. The overturned ship makes for some interesting level design, and even though the music is reused from the illness to spread, it fits well enough. Nyakaza Metro is the second best chapter in the game. The amount of colors and life put into this huge sandbox world, the deeply sinister and very well animated Empress, and the new music and costumes make this area absolutely majestic. Goro Majima reference. I don't play Yakuza, but I'd be remiss if I didn't give this a win. Catch her. Make it quick. Reward is one million. <laughs> 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 
Okay, I don't understand at all why they went to Sprout for the finale. Rush Hour isn't bad, but it robs us of a proper boss fight against the Empress. At least with Arctic Cruise, it made sense to not have a boss fight. There was no villain in that chapter, even though you probably could have had the captain attack you after wrecking your ship, but it works well enough without a boss. Here, we have a villain to take down, and all we get is a simple chase through the city in Subway, which is extremely lackluster. Alright, I'm sure many of you were waiting for this one. Death Wish. Essentially what Death Wish is, is a series of challenges that take the normal levels and add things that make them harder than they would be normally. And judging these levels is probably where the disclaimer is at its strongest because, let's face it, a mode like this isn't for everyone. Only a select few can even survive most of these challenges, let alone complete them. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through every single challenge and judge them based on the challenge they present and just how much of a challenge they are, especially in comparison to the normal level. You got that? Okay, let's start with Beat the Heat. This one actually ain't too bad for a first challenge. Essentially, it takes heating up Mafia Town and gradually makes it hotter over time. The objective is the same, you just need to use the pool or buckets of water to cool off every now and then. The side objectives of not overheating once and only cooling off twice can be a little annoying, but in my experience, they actually weren't that bad. I think I'm gonna give this one a win for how beginner friendly it is. So you're back from outer space. This is an interesting one because it highlights just how forgiving Death Wish is. The thing is, you don't need to do all three objectives at once. You can do them separately if doing all three is too much, which is an option I appreciate. In this instance, you're going through an obstacle course that basically extends the she came from outer space level. It can be annoying if you tackle all three objectives at once, but tackling them separately, this one is a natural step up from Beat the Heat. Collect-a-thon. This one might actually be easier than the previous one. The challenge is to run around Mafia Town trying to collect 100 pawns, but you lose one pawn every second, and you can only collect 300 pawns before you die, with the side objectives being not collecting more than 200 pawns total, or breaking boxes or crates. The main difficulty of this one is honestly based on whether or not you can keep your cool, because believe it or not, you can do all three if you keep a level head. If you panic, then you'll more than likely lose, but by keeping calm and following the layout of the town, this one ain't all that bad. Vault Codes in the Wind. This is where things start to get annoying. It's the Golden Vault level that I skipped over because nothing noteworthy happens there, only you have 30 seconds to collect each Vault Code with a timer resetting for every code you collect. You also can't use the Time Stop Hat and gotta find a time to kill 10 Mafia along the way. Now with the Time Stop Hat, this one ain't too bad. In fact, most recommend that you tackle the side objectives separately because finding the time to kill 10 Mafia and collect the Vault Codes without the Time Stop Hat is annoying as hell. I'm kind of split on whether I want to give this a win or a sin, but given how hard it is without a useful item as well as being plenty challenging in general, I think I'll give this one a sin. Rift Collapse Mafia of Cooks. This one's part of the pink time risk that I haven't touched upon because I don't find them that interesting outside of the storybooks you get, which we'll touch upon after this. Basically, this is the same as the pink rift for Mafia Town, but you're on a time loop with the side objectives being finishing with 30 seconds left and collecting all the rift pawns. It's pretty simple and much like Collectathon, only really a problem if you panic. If you keep a level head, you can get all three done in no time. In fact, with one exception, the other rift classes are the same, only they're too unmemorable to win or sin, so I'm gonna skip over those. She speed ran from outer space. This one kind of sucks. It's exactly what it says it is with the side objectives lowering your goal from 150 to 120. Yeah, you're expected to shave 30 seconds off whatever your initial time is. And you basically need a guy just to know the most optimal path to the mafia. I'm sure you could figure this one out yourself, but why would you? I personally was able to get a time of 1 minute, 15 seconds, and 54 milliseconds, and I don't even know how I did it. Especially when the timer doesn't stop during the cutscenes. Mafia jumps. Yes, they use the she came from outer space level three times. This one is confusing as hell. You gotta complete the normal level in 15 jumps or less, with the side objectives lowering it to seven jumps or less. While it is doable to make it to the Mafia without jumping once, you need to be pixel perfect in your following jumps because you need exactly seven jumps to complete the obstacle course. You mess up once, you better restart, and man, that shit is obnoxious. Encore, encore. This one could go itself with a javelin for all I care. I know that sounds harsh, but that's how I feel after trudging through it. It's the Mafia boss fight again, only much harder than normal, with the side objectives being not missing your Q to attack and beating him with the one-hit hero badge equipped. Fighting him normally, this fight isn't that bad, but when you have the one-hit hero badge equipped, it is a nightmare. I died in an embarrassing amount of times, and a lot of them were due to either careless mistakes that are way too easy to make, or me not remembering the time stop hat was a thing. Even when I did remember to use the time stop hat, this bastard was so frustrating to take down without getting hit. I'm glad he's stuck in the jar after this, because he deserves it after a fight like this. 
Security breach. No, not that one. This one is mildly annoying, but at the same time, not that bad. You're essentially becoming Solid Snake through a dead bird studio that's under heavier guard than normal, and the side objectives involve racking up less than 200,000 pawns and fees and not getting caught once. I don't hate this one enough to sin it, but it's not fun enough to really give a win either. It's just kind of there, being mildly annoying, but not much more. The Great Big F***ing and Annie. This one sucks so much. You want to know why it's so bad compared to the Big Parade? It's simple. The Big Parade only had seven band members. The Death Wish has 50. I'm not joking. Go ahead. Count them yourself. There's 50 of them. And that reduces the amount of space you have significantly. And that's not even bringing up the side objectives, which are not getting hit by the band members or letting any Gruze tokens expire. Both are a pain to achieve on their own, let alone both at once. And it's no wonder why people hate this Death Wish. 10 seconds until self-destruct. I get the feeling this one hates you because man is it cruel. It's train rush, but the time limit has been reduced significantly. You gotta constantly get clocks to extend the time limit while going through a much harder train rush. And the side objectives make you collect every conductor token and go through with no hat abilities and the one hit hero badger quit. Do you see now why I feel like this one hates you? Because all of that is so ludicrous for the sake of it. Killing two birds. You know you're in for an intense time when this is the intro music. In spite of that though, I actually had a bit of fun with this one. Normally, it's the conductor and DJ Grooves by only both birds are here. It's chaotic for sure, but with careful use of the time stop hack, it's kind of fun. It's the side objectives that make it not so fun. Winning with more than 100 seconds left isn't hard at all, but focusing on one director until they go down makes the fight much harder. Despite that, however, I still can't say that I hate this fight. Yeah, this one gets a win from me. Sidestepping a bit, there are these candles with little mini challenges as well, and almost all of them are anything special. Most of them are just finding snatcher coins throughout the levels, which isn't a problem thanks to the compass badge. The only two exceptions are the one where you need to kill every enemy type, as well as a certain amount of mafia and papa scrows, and get four time pieces without jumping. The latter is the one I want to focus on, because the former isn't anything special. Along with the required train rust, it's recommended that the other three you do are Welcome to Mafia Town, Picture Perfect, and Mail Delivery Service. Welcome to Mafia Town isn't too bad if you use the ice hat and no bonk badge. Picture Perfect is a bit tricky, but once you figure out how to get to the rooftops without touching the tight ropes, all you need to do is get your picture taken the next time, stand in an alleyway, swear on TV, and you're gold. Oh, and Mail Delivery Service is so easy you can stay on the bike the entire time. Train Rush, however, is a completely different beast. It's already chaotic enough as is, but doing so without jumping makes the level five times harder. Special mention to this jump in particular. I swear, it feels like total guesswork if you'll pull it off correctly or not. It's that inconsistent. Speed run well. This one sucks too. It's exactly what it says it is, but the side objectives lower the goal from 2 minutes to 125, which is just absurd. You basically have to do everything perfectly to get a winning time in this level. My best time was 1 minute, 22 seconds, and 0.4 milliseconds, and that was by pushing myself to the absolute limit, man. Quality time with Snatcher. This is another one that I weirdly had fun with. It's the Snatcher fight, but he doesn't throw blue potions, so as a result, you can't damage him. You normally have to survive for two minutes, but the side ejectors increased that to six minutes. That sounds like a tall order, and it kinda is given how fast Snatcher gets towards the end, but I still had a bit of fun with this one, especially since I got to listen to your contract as inspired for an extended period of time. Boss Rush. Exactly what it says it is. A boss rush. This is honestly the one I had the most fun with. Going through every one of the game's fantastic bosses was quite fun, even with the one new hero badge and not missing my chance to attack. It did get a little hairy towards the end, but I still had a smile on my face the whole time. Breaching the contract. I have a love-hate relationship with this one. On one end, it's actually kind of fun despite how chaotic it could get. Following the shockwaves that come out of most attacks is engaging, but on the other hand, not letting my health lower to 1 HP or only throwing blue potions at Snatcher is frustrating. You don't necessarily need to be perfect, but it damn near feels like it. Because of that, I'm not sure if I want to win it or sin it. You know what? Because of Snatcher, I'll give it a win. But just this once. Bird Sanctuary. This, this is, this is torture! It's the birdhouse, only you can't kill any of the birds. And there's a metric... 
marked under them all over the place. Even worse, the side objectives make you kill the six hidden mafia and get through it with the one hit hero badge. I swear, unless you have ascended to a higher plane of existence, you are never going to get all three in one go. It's simply not possible unless you're a god. What's really unfair is that the exploding eggs around the birdhouse might kill a bird or two in the explosion, which counts as you killing them. F*** this death wish to hell. Wound up windmill. Would you believe me if I said that many considered this to be the worst death wish of the lot? Well, I don't think it's quite that bad, but it's just as bad as Bird Sanctuary. It's the windmill level, only it's shifted into maximum overdrive. Everything is far faster and you're required to go through with no hat abilities and the one-hit hero badge, as well as reaching the end in four minutes. Reaching the end in four minutes actually ain't too bad once you have it down, but with the one-hit hero badge and no hat abilities, everything in this windmill blows. Pun intended. The Illness has speed run. This one's not really as bad as the previous two, but it's still pretty bad. It's exactly what it says it is. The Illness has spread in under 7 minutes, 6 with the side objectives. You gotta memorize the best paths to where the flowers are, and the timer doesn't stop during cutscenes. But what especially irritates me is the fact that running back to the zip lines wastes too much time. So what do you do? Throw yourself over the side so you take damage and teleport to the zip line. How would you know to do that? Try anything, because that's the logic of this death wish, apparently. Rift Collapse Deep Sea. This one gets special mention due to the fact that it has the same requirements as the other Rift Collapses, just with the hardest one in the entire game. Without those stipulations, the Rift still wasn't memorable enough to mention, but with them, this level becomes arduous and painful. Cruising for a bruising. That title could not be more accurate if it tried. This is easily the hardest and most painful death wish of them all. It's ship shape, but they've upped the amount of tasks from 18 to 40. 70 with the side objectives. Even worse, one of the side objectives requires you to complete 40 tasks without missing one, which is even more torturous. This legitimately feels like it was made out of spite, as if the devs wanted to torture us with this. I doubt it was, but it certainly feels like it. You seriously need perfect memorization of the ship, quick reflexes, and the mercy of RNGesus to complete this stage normally. My fingers were aching by the time I was done, and I don't want anyone else to experience this ever. The Mustache Gauntlet. Now, relatively speaking, this was a huge breath of fresh air. That said, it's still kinda annoying. It's the final level, but made a bit harder, and you gotta kill all 99 bad guys because 100 is one too many. The side objectives are not getting burned, which is easier said than done given that there's enough fire and lava to make Bowser blush, and not using the projectile badge. The first two sections of the gauntlet aren't too bad, and they're gracious enough to give you checkpoints for each area, but the last section is pretty annoying to get through, especially with the ninja cats. Not to mention, the checkpoints can also be a curse should you happen to miss one or two enemies. Overall, I'd say this one's actually good enough to warrant a win, but even then, there's a bit of an asterisk on it. No more bad guys. I think I don't mind this one? Don't get me wrong, it's hard as balls, but I can weirdly find some enjoyment in this. It's Mustache Girls, but I only made 10 times harder with even more attacks that absolutely flood the screen at points. The side objectives make you not use any hat abilities and only stay in the hyper zone, that's this colorful arena by the way, for only 3 minutes. I won't lie, I struggled on this one a lot, especially towards the end when she pretty much raises hell on earth. But when I finally managed to get to a point where I could consistently triumph, I felt satisfied. Even when not using the handy dandy time stop at, I still felt like I was having at least some fun. So I guess I gotta give this one a win? Eh sure, why not. Seal the deal. Seal the f***ing deal. The final death wish is, what else? A boss rush of all the power to bosses you fought before. You get three chances, you're stuck with the health you have when you enter the fight should you die, and the side objectives don't let you use hat abilities or let your health lower to 1 HP. I know I've given most of these bosses a fair shake, but that was individually. In a boss rush where you can't heal in between attempts, it's a whole other story. And need I mention Snatcher at the end? This guy is basically cheating at the end with him throwing in Mustache Girl's timepieces and Conductor GJ Gru's saws and light fixtures. It's not quite as bad as even Alpine Skyline's death wishes, but it is brutal as hell to complete. And after all of that, after trudging through every challenge, completing every objective and candle, and getting every extra item, what's your big prize for defeating Death Wish? What? You're not dead? 
This book was useless, I should sue. Uh, you completed all my contracts, but somehow you're still alive to test me. Thanks, I guess. Really, that's just great. Congratulations. Huh? You want a reward? Look, kid, we've done this before. You really need to learn to negotiate up front. I get the feeling you're not going to leave me alone unless I hand over something. It's always about you. Huh? You know, you weren't even supposed to make it this far. They should be picking out flowers for you right now. So I guess we can't always get what we want. Now there, there. At least you have the feeling you achieved something. You earned it. If it wasn't clear, our business is concluded. Go bother someone else, kiddo. Just an achievement with a side of Snatcher's salty tears. Worth it. Totally worth it. Dang, no wonder Snatcher's the way he is. Didn't expect someone like Snatcher to have such a tragic backstory. Makes him a lot more sympathetic, even though he is very much an evil ghoul now. Wow, there are two tragic characters in this game. Puts things into perspective a lot more for the captain's demeanor. I feel bad, man. Make that three. Why did this game A get so serious all of a sudden and B excel at it? I'm feeling emotional, guys. This is exactly why I always pick the conductor for the boss fight. Gruz and his penguins are too kind to be twist villains. Win for all the feels this game has pulled. The Roomba has a backstory. They gave the little Roomba and Hat Kid ship a bat story. And it's positively adorable. This is something I never knew I needed. Here we go! So, unless you play this game on PC with a mod that lets you do otherwise, this is the only instance in both the base game and the DLC where you get to play as Mustache Girl, and I don't get why it's here of all places, unless you willingly mess around, this section is over in seconds. I get it if the ship was redesigned to be a level, or you had to traverse the ship's roots to find a way to unlock the safe, but no, you could have had this be a cutscene and nothing would change. And while on the subject, I don't understand why they decided to make Bo Kid an entirely new character for the co-op instead of just using Mustache Girl. She controls exactly the same as Hat Kid, and she's the character people would want to play as. So why would you go through the effort of making a completely new character who doesn't add anything other than this goofy-ass sticker on the title cards? And don't say it'd be weird if there were two Mustache Girls, because Super Mario Galaxy and DMC3 would like to refute that. Both of those games have a mode where you play as the other guy, and not only do they have two of the same character, they roll with it with a red Virgil and the Luigi being weirded out by another him. Hell, you could have done something like Mustache Girl using a timepiece to go back in time and stop the Mafia herself. Look, I just want to play his little red rebel hood for more than 10 seconds, okay? <laughs> the final level is a nearly perfect final challenge to the game. Outside of Death Wish, it's the hardest level in the game, but at no point does it ever feel unfair. 
Everything is designed to where you can get through it if you put your mind to it, and any and all mistakes feel like your fault. And just because I know someone's gonna be like, I hate this final level because it's Discount Bowser's castle. No, none of that. The influence is there, but to write it off as just Discount Bowser's castle is dismissive of what it does right, which is just about everything. She can get lost! Mustached girl is not welcome here! Mafia say get lost! That's right, get lost! No one wants you here! Isn't that right, big lad? This alternate reality stinks! Get lost! Is this part of the final boss corny? Yes. Is it still the best way you can end the game and shire mustache girl's entire black and white view of the world? Also yes. The final boss may not be the most amazing thing ever, but it's still a pretty good fight. Mustache girl's uses of the timepieces, the other characters helping out the best way they can, and the somewhat heartfelt sacrifice from the others towards the end make this fight a satisfying conclusion to the game. Not better than prior fights, but still a fitting conclusion. And even though I said that the Toilet of the Dooms theme felt more like a final boss than the actual final boss theme, You Are All Bad Guys is still a good track in its own right, and worth the win as well. Okay, so the game acts like making the decision to give Mustache Girl a timepiece will lead to some sort of bad ending, but nope, the ending's the same no matter what you choose. That said, I still gotta win this because even when you throw away the fake motivation the game presents, there's still plenty of reason to choose one or the other. On the one end, despite how moronic the Mafia are, they're still terrible people. They invaded the island and continuously harassed whatever denizens remained there. Mustache Girl welcomed them with open arms and lost everything. She's been fighting them for who knows how long, and with the timepiece, she could get her home back. But on the other hand, we saw what happened when she had that kind of power. She made herself supreme ruler of the entire planet, made everyone on it, innocent or guilty, make queues a mile long, force them to go through death traps just to get to her, and even then she might judge them as a bad guy and kill them anyway. Granted, from her judgment of Hackett, she wasn't completely blind, but she still went off the deep end. By giving her the timepiece, all that could happen again. Yeah, she had all the timepieces then, but we've seen throughout the game that people are willing to kill for just one of these things. Maybe that's why Hat Kid chose to not go along with Mustache Girl's idea of using them. She clearly knows their power, but chooses to not indulge in it, outside of using it to fuel her ship. The only time she does use it is to undo the damage Mustache Girl did. Perhaps she chooses to not indulge in their power for fear of them corrupting her just as they did to the people on that planet. Now, I'm not going to urge you to pick one or the other, as it's not my place to say something like that. But I will say that personally, I give her the timepiece, because she deserves to have her home back. And hey, maybe she won't go off the deep end with just one. Let me know what you guys chose. I'd love to hear it. Don't 
Don't you dare leave, lass! Let's watch our movie, darling! Aww, even after all the bad stuff they did, they consider Hat Kid a friend. And even Hat Kid's tearing up at the thought of leaving. This game can do emotional moments superbly well. <laughs> Overall, A Hat in Time is a fantastic game. It came out around the same time as Super Mario Odyssey, one of the best Mario games ever made, and managed to not only avoid being overshadowed, but also gain a strong community too. This was Gears for Breakfast's first game, and they hit it out of the park. Obviously, it ain't perfect as reflected in the Sin Counter, but the mountain of good it does makes it a shining beacon among indie games. This is a game that I can play any day of the week, and is quite possibly my favorite 3D platformer of all time, which is quite an achievement given how much I love Super Mario Odyssey. I'm Tony Sonic, and I hope you enjoyed the start of this new series. Sorry it took a while to make, I've just been feeling like a wreck for a few weeks or so, but I still got it out nonetheless. Say, how about a little challenge? If you guys can get this video to 150 likes, or donate $10 via super thanks, I'll make a short little video of me and DT doing Hat Kids Little Dance. But only if you guys can get this video to that many likes, or willing to donate that much, collectively or all at once. Anyways, next time we'll be discussing Remix, and some unpopular opinions that come along with them. See you next time everybody!